Okay. Why do direct map caches have a higher miss rate than set associative caches? Doesn't matter. Put any N there you like. Why do these have a higher miss rate than these? Because these have a higher conflict miss than these. This reduces conflict misses. So therefore, total misses will be reduced because conflict. The answer is conflict. If you didn't write the word conflict miss, can't help you. There's three kinds of misses. What are the three kinds? Cold start or compulsory. Conflict and capacity misses. If they're the same size, the capacity is, shh, guys. If they're the same size, capacity misses are the same. Conflict and cold start, no change. What's different? Conflict misses. Associativity lowers the conflict misses. All right, that's the answer to that one. The answer to what kind of hit rates we can expect from a well-designed TLB was found right here. The miss rates are this to this, so the hit rates are what? 99% to 99.99. The answer is right there. Gave it to you two seconds earlier. All right? Oh, oh. All right. And, yeah. We talked about it. I even did the subtraction and said the man, I said the words out loud in the class to you all. I didn't, say the, I didn't say the miss rate is 1 to 0 0.001. I said the hit rate is 99 to 99.99. Yeah? As for the kind, what kind? Not the kind. Yeah, what kind of hit rates? Ne tip, ne beach him, ne, 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 you know. Oh, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a native speaker, what kind of, you know, no, 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 no. It means, it means what order of, what, what, Alan, what, no, 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 no. No, no, sorry, friends, it's a number. No, 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 sorry. Okay. All right. The middle question asks, um, what's a right buffer? Who knows what a right buffer is? Give a good short definition of a right buffer. Take care. Hardware between the Erlang cache and uh, main memory uh, used for okay. the right back and right forward. Okay. I like your definition, except for you made it too specific. You said between level one and main memory. How about just between any two levels in the memory hierarchy? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So and it's used for writing. He said both kinds, right back and right through. Good. Okay. All right. Let's um, let's continue. All right. I'm going to I'm going to now shh, I'm going to now address the issue we wanted to address earlier. Remember, the issue here was whoa. Let's do caching in parallel with translation. Right? Wouldn't it be great if we could do that and not have them hard to shill? Well, this is the answer. Look at this. If the cache and translation look aside buffer is designed right. The virtual page number can go to the, what's this? TLB, right? And what are we doing with the virtual page number? Trying to get a physical address. So give this, if it's a hit, boom, we get the physical address. All right, now, at the same time, you can send the page offset, which remember is the index into whatever cache system we have. So you can say, be trying to find the physical page number at the same time that you're trying to find the cache block and have a hit. But of course, this isn't the full thing. We also need to have this match the tag. So look what we do. We find the index and we say, hey, bring those guys down. And of course, that's the slow part of memory is accessing and getting it out. <coughs> so we bring these out and now we ask the question, does this, which is the tag, match the physical address, and the answer is we compare them. Because we've got this out of that cache and this out of this cache, we do a comparison. If that's a hit, this is what I want. If that's a hit, then this is what I want. If neither one's a hit, I don't have a hit. Right? This is an associative cache, could be any kind of cache. So you got it? The idea is, if this is sent to here, and if this is the right number of bits to be sent to here and the boundary doesn't require this many, if I can send this to here and this to here, I can do them in parallel. So I'm doing TLB lookup and cache lookup at the same time. I overlap them, I make them parallel, exactly what we would like to do. And that's the goal of this slide without the problems of this slide. We're not sending virtual address to cache, we're actually sending the physical address to cache. Where's the physical address? Half of it's here, which is the part that doesn't translate, and the other half comes out of here, which is the part that we did translate. But luckily, I can send the we don't translate part and start the cache access, and send the we translate part later to finish the cache access. Yeah, that's how it works. 
Very clever approach here. So we end up with, as you can see, virtual memory with TLB speed up with no penalty in time. It's just as fast as cache access. In fact, everybody can say, well, this is small and that's going to come fast, and this is bigger and that's going to come slow, and yes, you're right. So therefore, did this slow down this? No, it didn't. Because we didn't put it first in R to shill, we put it in parallel, and this is quicker than this, so therefore, by the time this gets here, this is already, hey, Kardesh, where were you? I've been waiting at this comparator. Come on, let's go. We got business to do. Right? Do you see how it works? Okay, so that's the way that manufacturers will design their systems in order to not slow down their high-speed clock. Yeah. Yeah, the block offset, as you remember, is if I have multi-word block, like if my block size is not one word but it's three or four, then I have to, when I finally get this, I have to say which part of it do I want. And so, you know, you'll, you'll not only choose which one of these, you'll actually choose the desired word from the block <laughs> offset. See this little bits here? comes down here and it says, of all the things going on in this MUX, which one do I want? And the answer is, one of these, but only part. So which one do I want is selected by this? Which part do I want is selected by this? Got it. So let's say this is four words and this is four words. What I want out, of course, is one word. So I pick which one based upon was it this hit or this hit, and then I pick which word out of the block size of four from these two bits which come to here. So that's how that works. So you could say it's an eight to one mux, but with the controls being split differently. All right, any other comments about this? Okay, so that's our last. And now we're gonna try to summarize the whole of chapter five, the concepts and pull it all together. So the next four slides will bring us to the end of our teaching material on chapter five. Let's have a look here. What parts of the virtual to physical uh, address translation are done by or assisted with hardware? This is a course in hardware. And we know that part of this is, of course, software, the operating system. But we do have hardware at work here for us. The most <laughs> important part is the translation look aside buffer. That's a cache. It follows all the principles of caching that we've already studied. Um, the access time of the TLB uh, is part of the cache hit time, and it may allocate an extra stage in the pipeline for TLB. Some pipelines, like the Intel pipeline, uh, do a TLB access stage because the pipeline is very many and the clocks are very short. Second one is page table storage. Yes, we've got to store this page table, and fault detection and updating get assisted by the hardware, okay? Page faults result in interrupts. We handle them like exceptions. So you saw there were some ex extra registers to be able to handle them. Um, but then we pass it on to the operating system for code. Hardware that must support this are the dirty and reference bits, which will help us to approximate least re recently used in the page tables. In other words, we want to know in the page tables who's been used so that kicking it out causes a write back. If it hasn't been used, we can just directly replace it. And then disk placement is also assisted by hardware. Uh, bootstrapping, which is out of disk sector zero when we boot up, so that the system can service a limited number of page faults before the operating system is even loaded. So we've got some stuff on disk, some stuff in main memory, and some stuff in a, a special small cache. Particularly, this is the one that we focused on today because it follows all the principles of caching. So now, let's summarize the whole thing. This is the 5.5, a common framework for memory uh, hierarchies. Question number one and question number two. Um, where can an entry be found or be placed in these caches? And if it's a direct map cache, if it's a set associative cache, and if it's a fully associative cache, then the answers are different. How many sets are there? In a fully associative cache, there's one set and it includes the whole of cache. In direct map cache, however many entries are, that's how many sets are, because set size is one. But in n-way set associative, then it's the number of entries divided by the associativity. That's how many sets there are. And so how many entries are there per set? Here one, here every one is in one set, and here it's whatever the associativity is, 2 to 16. Okay, now the next question is the location. How do you find the thing? If it's direct mapped, if it's set associative, if it's fully associative, we have the, how, what method is used for locating it, and how many comparisons are needed. Now, if you do the comparisons with one comparator, it means R to shill. If you do them in parallel, it means that many parallel hardware comparators. Obviously, if it's a direct map cache, we index into it, <coughs> no, and we only need to have one comparison. Is it yes or no? Okay. Um, does the tag match yes or no? One comparator will work. 
If it's fully associative, then we have to compare all the entries' tags. And uh, either have to have a separate lookup table or have to have a massive amount of parallel hardware here. So we have to have the number of entries um, uh, for the number of comparisons. And for a separate lookup table, we don't have any comparisons at all. So we could either do that or do that as approaches here. For set associative, which is in the middle, we index into the set. Remember, we index and then we find a whole set. And then we compare the set's tags in parallel. So you have to have that many comparators in whatever it happens to be, the degree of associativity. Okay, so that's the first thing is there's some costs in time and space that this table tells us about. <coughs> now the third question that you can ask about all caching systems is which entry should be replaced on a miss? Who should we kick out if we want to bring somebody new in? For a direct map cache, it's easy. There's only one. It goes out because the new one comes in there. But in set associative or fully associative, you have a group. And it could be any member of that group that you're going to kick out. And you have to select. You could select randomly. And we saw that in our software. It had a random selection of which member to kick out. Or we could try to do least recently used or approximately least recently used, which was where, where did we see that? Yeah, right here. That means pseudo least recently used. Not perfectly, but more or less one of the recently used ones. If you have two-way set associative, it means you've got a choice of two. Who do you kick out? Randomly choosing which one to kick out has a miss rate about 1.1 or 10% higher than perfect least recently used. So if you just choose randomly and save yourself the extra time and space, your performance hit is about a 10% um, higher miss rate. Well, 4% versus 4.4% matters. 0 0.001 versus 0 0.001. 1, 1 matters. Remember, these miss rates, we're trying to beat them down. So that's interesting enough that we would like to not do random, but do LRU. LRU is too costly to implement perfect LRU when you get high levels of associativity, especially greater than 4, since tracking the usage of who was used when requires a whole lot of extra bits and difficult algorithm. So what's usually done is, as I said here, approximate LRU, if you had a set size of 4 or 8 or 16, we'd just say <coughs> one of the least recently used ones was this, kick it out. Can't know exactly which one. Okay. Now, the fourth question to be asked, which summarizes again the whole uh, cache uh, and memory management approach here is, what happens on a write? Do we do write through or do we do write back? And they both have their pros and cons. And this is a key slide. You should, of course, know this. Right through and right back, I could have even asked them on the quiz. Those are key terms. By now, everybody should know them. But one more time, let's give a good review here and teach them so that we all leave today knowing what they are. Right through, the information that's written um, to the cache is also right then written to the level below, maybe with a write buffer or some other method. But we're going to do a double write. We write it through here and right on through to the one below. That's the main idea behind it, OK? Um, and, see the and is? to the memory of the next lower level, OK? It's always combined with a write buffer so that the write weight uh, to the next level can be eliminated. We notice we don't stall a processor to write to both levels. We write to the fast one, and we give it to the write buffer, which will do our job like a slave to write to the lower level, OK? As long as the write buffer isn't full. If the write buffer is full, then you stall. The processor has to stall. Now, write back is different. Write back says, just put it in the higher level. That means the one below is not a perfect copy anymore. The new one is on top, and the old biot one is down below. And so we have to make sure that when we're done with the new one, and when we, we kick it out of the cache, we remember to write it back into the lower level. OK, let's have a little more of that rap video. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Everybody seen that? It's pretty good. You should watch it. I can't sing, and I hate rap, but <laughs> it's, it's done very well. By the way, if you know the person who did it, please tell them thank you. I really appreciate that. It made me smile. <laughs> My wife got the biggest kick out of that. So she said, that guy is great. He's so creative. So anyway, so the information is written only to the entry in the current memory level, the current level of the, of the hierarchy. The modified entry is later written to the next level of memory. But when? Only when it's replaced. Only when we have to kick it out. That's when we have to write it back. So now you need to have a dirty bit for every cache block to say, has it been changed? If it's been changed, you must write it back when it's kicked out. If it's clean, meaning we only read from it, read from it, read from it, never changed it, we don't have to write it back because it's perfectly in sync with the one below. 
But if we change that, it's not perfectly in sync with the one below. It's dirty, like dirty laundry. You have to send it back. So the dirty bit will help us. And virtual memory systems always use write back of dirty pages to disk because writing from memory down to its lowest, no, next lowest level disk is such a huge deal. We only want to do it once in a blue moon when we have to. So virtual memory systems only, only will take a page in memory and write it to disk when it has to, when it's being kicked out of memory. Okay, then we write back to disk because disk writes are slow. Pros and cons of both are given here, but I'm going to move on because we've got to finish up. All right, summarizing now, all of chapter five. Key concepts, top level, kush bakish. What do you need to walk out of here saying, yes, I understand that, I got the main idea? The first one is the principle of locality. This, we wouldn't even be talking about caching unless we could have some kind of a confidence that frequently used members will have a high hit rate and there is such a thing as a subset of my code and data which is frequently used. If there's no such thing as a subset, if it's all over and you can't collect them, then there's no locality. But in fact, programs are likely to access a relatively small amount of their uh, code and data at any instant of time. Uh, locality in time is called temporal locality. That says if I went there, I'm likely to come back soon in time. Spatial locality says if I went there, I'm likely to soon go near in space. You know, neighbors, okay, Ad neighboring addresses. Those two. And this principle is the key. Is if without this, it makes no sense. Why are we doing this caching stuff, sir? You know, this is why it works. If, it, we didn't, if this wasn't true, it wouldn't work. Some programs have real tight locality. Other programs have much broader locality. Kind of depends on how the code and, and data access patterns are. Jumps and branches, looping, whether the data is structured or unstructured, you know, which kind of abstract data type you use. These will determine how you own or how diverse the, the, uh, the data is. Caches, translation, look aside buffer, and even virtual memory. Look at them, they're so different. This is for data and code. This is for translation of virtual addresses to physical addresses. <coughs> this is for you know, memory and disk. They're, goodness gracious. But what about them? They're all understood by examining the same four questions because they're all memory hierarchy issues, just different places in the hierarchy. Where can you put the entry? Go back two slides and look at the options. How is the entry found? Go back th three slides and look at the options. Who to replace on a miss, and how do you handle rights? Those are the four fundamental questions, and I've just reviewed them for you now so that you understand their importance, and the details are all in the slides and in the chapter. Okay. Now, page tables do mapping from virtual to physical addresses. The virtual address is the address the processor thinks the code and data is at, but the physical address is the place it's really at. Well, why wouldn't they be the same? The answer is they could be the same if you were the only process on the, on the uh, computer, but if you want to share it with anybody else, then they can't be the same. Because when you say I want address zero and I say I want address zero, we mean different things. So we can't store them both at the same physical address zero. Okay. And therefore, since this table gets too big uh, to hold in transistors and we have to put it into dynamic RAM memory, it's slow. So we speed it up with a TLB for fast translation. And that's it. Okay, and that leaves us uh, a few minutes to do the uh, evaluation. So I'm going to take questions, and then after that, I'll I'll let you do the evaluation. Uh, not yet. Let's see if there's any questions. Um, any questions about Chapter Five? We covered it pretty quick, but we, I hope we covered the main points well enough that you left understanding the key. Of course, the details are in the book. You should read and study. Um, any, anybody have any comments or questions about Chapter Five's principles or? more examples. Okay, then